Uh, my name is Sineda Norder. I'm the director of Wildland. It's my first feature. I'm Ingeborg Topso, and I'm the writer of Wildland. Let's get up! Go! Let's get up! Hi and welcome to the 34th Teddy Award. My name is Jan Felix Wuttig and I'm sitting here with director Jeanette Norda and author Ingeborg Topsu to talk about their film Wildland. Hi, welcome to the festival. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> I really found your, your movie quite impressive and quite having quite a, a very strong emotional impact on the various different topics that, that it talks about. One of them being uh, family and how it's sort of how you're born into it, how it might be nice in a place of comfort, but it also gives you a certain weight that you carry around with you. And there's this, this quote in the film for some people, things go wrong before they even begin. So maybe you could talk about a little bit how you conceive that, that image or that theme of family in the film. I mean, I think, as you said, it's sort of that was sort of very central that that bit of the voiceover and sort of the starting point. And I think we always wanted to sort of, you know, I think in Denmark there's like a big tradition for family drama, and we wanted to play with genre elements. And then these mafia elements just made sense because it's actually all about you know social heritage and what you pass on. But it's mostly looked at from a slightly different perspective of like who's the new person in charge, you know, with you look at Godfather and whatever. And we just wanted it to be more about the family and as you're saying this continuation and in a way no one's the new one in charge. It's just the family keeps going and the individuals are sort of fighting in it or against it or for it. Yeah. 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 So it was always like you're saying a bigger story than just eaters, although it's very much mm -hmm. you know a sort of subjective film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it takes social heritage quite seriously, like you say, you have this feeling of the family being the most important, what you're born into, and breaking free from the path that has been laid out in front of you can be very, very difficult. Yeah. And the power of the community, I mean, the power to say no to the community, is that even possible to break free from it? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, those were the elements we discussed from very, very early on in the process, uh, yeah, from the beginning, right. basically. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it seems at times very heartfelt and at times almost like a curse in a way. Mm. And, and, and Ida seems to soak it all up and sort of internalize it all. And, and it, it seems so characteristic. It seems so, such, like uh, your, your main actress, uh, Sandra, she, she seems like an ideal choice because there's so much sort of, she's soaking up all that pain and all that discomfort and kind of seeking for for things she can connect with. Um, I guess my question is, how, how did you go about the casting process? How did you find your, your I, protagonist? I think uh, I was very, very lucky. I mean, Ida, how you see the film now, was how she was in the script. And we knew very, I mean, we knew it would be very, very difficult finding someone who was able to transcend what you're specifically talking about now. 
that you can read her observing everything. Um, and Sandra was actually the first one I had for an audition. I don't cast very many people. I don't say, okay, let's just okay. open casting. I kind of choose. And she was my casting agent, was like, ah, this one, she, she's interesting. I saw her many, many years ago. Maybe let's just give it a go. And she came as the first one there. She, she was a bit early. I was a bit early. And I remember her walking up the stairs thinking, that's how I imagined her. So I was really, really lucky and I didn't quite believe my luck and it took me three months to kind of say, this is what we're going to go with. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and the, the way that tension is kind of built in the, in the film, I mean, there, there seems to be that there's no comfort at all for either. There always seems to be, or in many scenes, there seems to be some um, supposed comfort and then there's an element of shock. Um, and after, after the accident, Ida has her first night out with her new family, basically, and she's, she's happy, she's kind of mingling as well. And then there's this scene where they both, him, uh, her and, and Mats, sort of playing video the games. Video game. yeah. And she asks, uh, he asks to, to, to see her breasts, and then it's all sort of down again. Um, could you maybe tell us how how you constructed that sort of comfort discomfort kind of narrative yeah i mean i think we always wanted the danger in the mundane as you say so it's sort of around the breakfast table or playing video games and it, even that scene is sort of it's quite uncomfortable but it's also then again a little bit innocent because he's like oh don't tell mom i asked you yeah. so it's just constantly that shift between is it a nice hug or is it like intimidating? Is it sort of an assertion of power? Is it a joke about the press? Or is this actually really creepy? Could you do something horrible? So I think we constantly wanted to play with that. And you know, it's a very subjective film. And from the beginning, we had this idea that Ida, although she's young, you know, she already lived a very specific childhood. And she's one of those children who when she comes home, she has to open the door and listen and trying to figure out what, what the mood is like that day. And I think, you know, if you don't grow up in a really stable home, which is sort of alluded to with her mom, you just get really alert because you're used to having to listen and trying to figure out when the mood changes. So that thing of her really quickly getting alert and being like, oh shit, is the mood, oh sorry, I swear, is the mood changing is really something you work with because you just see the whole film through her perspective. Yeah. And I think that's what, like you say, creates the tension. I mean, because you keep on thinking, okay, so this is a safe environment. This is where I'm supposed to feel safe. Around the breakfast table, or playing a video game. And then we just give these little twists all the time, which makes you on your toes. Yes. Um, yeah. And it, it actually kind of, I thought about this, this there's these kind of in-between images, especially at night, where you just kind of see the flat, like for a couple of seconds, where it seems almost like Ida is sort of listening in, into, yeah. and at, at one, at, I think the first morning, she's kind of getting up and she's listening and there's uh, Mats kind of pounding away at his, uh, this, this uh, box bag. So yeah, that's, that's Yeah, that cool. is yeah. that alertness we really wanted exactly. to break. It was the, a, a visualization of yeah. that, yeah, having all your antennas out all the time. Yeah. yeah. And there's um, this very pivotal moment of, of the kiss between uh, 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 Ida and, and Anna. And uh, it seems, well, <laughs> it doesn't seem in any way sexual. It seems more like in a way that there's some communion between them. And I kind of felt that this was a sign of, of innocence, basically, because she's the only person that she feels sort of connected to, because she's not sort of mingled up in that in the sort of in the crime. Basically. Mm -hmm. Was that how do you how you intended? Yeah, I, I think Anna is the story's moral compass. I mean, she keeps seeing the family for what the family is, and obviously she has a friendship with Ida, Ida that evolves throughout the story. And I think when they have that kiss, it's a moment where Ida needs the comfort and that comfort she gets from Anna. Yeah. It's also a kiss with 
like the moral compass, right? With the with the with the good choice. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also in that kiss, there's like so much because yeah. you know. Ida already knows that Anna's life is not going to be yeah. what Anna imagines, because yeah. she doesn't. But it's actually also the first time that Ida sort of adopts Baldi's body language. Mm -hmm. So it's this, I mean, there's definitely a connection. And Anna's oddly the most sane person in the film, but it's actually also the point where Ida sort of goes her direction and sort of, in a way, adapts Baldi's moral a little bit, mm -hmm. because she doesn't tell Anna what's going on what's happening yeah, yeah yeah so it's sort of yeah there's a lot in it i think but i think that's definitely a cry for you know, comfort yeah. Okay. yeah yeah um and what kind of um seems to well destroy a lot in the film or maybe not destroy but there's a strong element of crime in the film but i kind of felt that that it was shown very almost it, it kind of creeps in it's almost minimalistically because we don't know what they do you know we, we don't know what what Jonas is up to when he when he goes and and, and takes uh, the, by, by car and um, how did you want to portray crime in the film because it's not so obvious not, at least not in the beginning mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I think like like Ingeborg said before that we wanted to take everything from the outside and make the house the most dangerous place to be, and not going into that whole crime thing. It just not it, it wasn't that's not what's important here. And the family is not fighting against outside enemies. They're not even fighting against each other. I mean, they're fighting against something within themselves, which goes back to what we talked about in the beginning. Um, that breaking free from one's past can be very, very difficult. And to stand alone is a very difficult task. So, yeah. Um, I, I found something in, in sort of the latter third of the film, uh, and I'm kind of leaning out of the window here metaphorically, but I found there was some newfound connection sort of uh, between uh, David and Ida, in mm -hmm. a sense, um, in the way that Ida has to go to jail mm. and almost seems to start when she started to, to bang her head mm. against the window and it almost it seemed to me like she's being put in a very di uh, similar position as David. Mm. It's always suggested that he has some sort of dependency but he's very helpless it seems at least that, that way. Um, was it also a thought that you had that there was some some yeah. newfound yeah and i think for sure also early on in the film david is sort of the one who's like oh why is she with us in the car why are we bringing her and i think there's definitely that sense of in a way he's gone through what she's gonna go through and he's sort of slightly more protective or keeping her separate and i think at the end definitely there's more connection yeah. because obviously also i mean without spoiling too much but what she does you know is sort of weighing heavily on him so i think there's definitely sort of a connection between them more than with the other brothers of them having slightly the same journey although at different times mm -hmm. yeah i'd say oh yeah definitely yeah. um yeah. well thank you so much i think that's it for for me thank um, you thank you for being here and thank you for a beautiful movie well thank you really so much enjoyed wildlife thank you. a lot <laughs> thank, yeah. you. thank you thank you Thank you.